<laughs> Your nose like this. Oh, baby, tell me all the home. <laughs> For beyond the sky, oh, they tell me of a home away. Oh, they tell me of a home where no storm cloud rise. Oh, they tell me of an uncloudy day. Oh, land of cloudless day. Oh, land of cloudless sky. Oh, they tell me of a home where no storm. They tell me that he smiles on his children there, and his smile drives us all runs away. And he tells me that no tear will ever come again in that lovely land of unclouded day. Of hands so kind and tender, they're leading me in paths that I must try. I have no fear when Jesus walks beside me, for I'm sure. Within the arms of God, 
He walks with me, and no one ever shall harm me. For I'm sheltered in the arms of God. So let the storms wait and the dark ones they won't worry. Within the arms of God, He walks with me, and no other shall harm me. For I'm sheltered in the arms of God. If you enjoy that, say amen. amen. Amen, I did. And I hope you did as well. That second song especially is one of my all-time favorites. Bob, didn't you and your daughters used to sing that? I thought I'd heard you sing that over in the old chapel. But uh, good song, good song. Have your Bibles turn to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And um, I'm going to read about the first nine verses, I think. Um, I came in tonight and Avery Osborne was talking about mowing his grass. How wide was that cut you had? Five foot cut. Five foot cut, yeah. And then Donnie got to talk about mowing the grass and uh, talking about mowing the ladies' yard for how much? A dollar or three dollars? Three dollars. I didn't have my glasses on. You should have shouted. <laughs> But he said, he said he mowed, and mowed it with a push mower, didn't he? <laughs> well, anyway, he said he mowed it, her yard and for $3 with a push mower. And when he got through, she didn't think he cut it low enough. <laughs> so I don't know if he had to mow it all over again or not. But it reminded me of a great Roy Davis story from many, many years ago when he was the superintendent of Sunday school at Grace Baptist Church. And he told this story. I told him I'll probably get it wrong but maybe you'll get the gist of it anyway. Going back several years, several years, let your minds go back, okay? Several years, and a uh, little boy goes in a drugstore. I'm thinking of something about like Pomona, uh, back in the old days, a Pomona drugstore. But, so Bob, we're going back that far, okay? Little boy goes into the store, and he's, there's a payphone on the wall. And he goes, he's, he's such a little boy, he's not even quite tall enough to reach the phone, so gets a couple of Pepsi crates and stands on the crates and gets up there and puts his dime in the phone. Now you know it's an old story. A dime in the phone, all right? And he picks up the phone and says, lady, I want to mow your yard. And she says, well, thank you, young man, but she said, I've already got a nice young man that mows my yard. He said, lady, I'll do a real, real good job. And she said, well, the boy I got now does a real, real good job. He said, lady, he said, I'll, he said, I will edge the sidewalks. And he said, I'll blow off the sidewalks and rake your yard, whatever it needs. I'll do an outstanding job. She said, she's starting to get a little perturbed, you know. She said, well, the young man I got now, he does a real good job. And he does all that. And she, he says, well, for whatever he's mowing it for, I'll mow it for a dollar less. She said, no, I'm satisfied with the young man I've got. Now you have a good day. Boy hangs up the phone, puts the Coca-Cola crates away, and the owner of the drugstore has been watching all this. And he says, young man, he said, I am mighty impressed with you. He said, I'll give you a job. Little boy said, that's all right. I'm just checking on the one I already got. <laughs> Was that close? Close. Okay. <laughs> I love that store. Love that store. But anyway, I hope you, if you mowed your yard today, I hope it wasn't 90 degrees when you're out there and had to mow your yard. I gotta, I'm, I'll set you up with a joke because I gotta tell you, tonight's message is not a touchy, feel good, dare I say Joel Osteen kind of message, all right? And if we took an offer and after, after tonight's message, we probably wouldn't get much uh, unless it was to be to get rid of the preacher. But uh, 2 Timothy chapter three talks about, you know, knowing also that in the last days, perilous times are gonna come, but um, 
And I don't even like my title. I'll call it an explanation of the future, but uh, we just leave that for what it is. But we'll just call it in the last days, perilous times shall come. Let's read the first nine verses and then I'll begin to make some comments. This know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Underline that word perilous, I'll define it later. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, coveted, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you about 19 things here quickly. They shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, uh, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such turn away, for of this sort are they which creep into houses, the Greek says slink, into houses, sneak into houses, and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers or various lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Uh, now as Janus and Jamboree's, these were the false uh, miracle workers, so to speak, uh, in Moses' day, they withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith, but they shall proceed no further for their folly shall be made manifest as all men as uh, unto all men as there also was. May God add his blessing to the reading of his precious word. The Greek here for this first verse, Kenneth Weiss translation said it means to say, it says this, this be constantly knowing that in the last days difficult times will set in. The phrase last days is used six times other times in the Bible. I'm going to give you those six real quickly. Uh, and it's this, Genesis 49.1 and Jacob, uh, you know, Jacob was Israel and his, you know, he had the 12 sons of Jacob, 12 sons of Israel. Jacob called unto his sons and said, gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Uh, Isaiah chapter two, verse two and Micah 4.1 say the same thing. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted from the hills and the nations shall flow unto it. Acts 2, 17, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. And that is Peter quoting from Joel chapter two, verses 28 through 32. Uh, then uh, in Hebrews chapter one, the first two verses, God who at sundry times and in divers manners, various manners, spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things by whom also he made the worlds. By the way, we are joint heirs with Christ. God made him an heir and he made us joint heirs, equal heirs, with Christ. You read that in Romans. Second Peter 3, 3, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. And then our text tonight begins with the phrase that in the last days, perilous times shall come. I want you, I want to mention three things, just an introduction about these last days. The last days includes all of the church age, but it actually began with the ministry, the life and ministry of Christ. So think about that. The beginning of the last days started with the life of Christ. We're getting now what we would call at the end of the last days. And, and I say that, and I'm thinking this as I say it, that I believe the stage is set for the rapture to take place. I really do. Uh, as far as I know, and I've talked to people who know a lot more about prophecy than I do, and I've read a few things, Dwight Pentecost and of course, uh, Glenn Matthews, uh, Dr. Steve Cook, all these men are very, very learned uh, on uh, prophecy and future things and end times. Uh, and uh, man, they say that there's absolutely nothing scripturally that they can find that we're waiting on to happen before Christ will come back. I believe the stages said all things are in order. Any day now, God could say to Christ, son, 
go get your bride. I believe that could happen, but we're in the end of the last days. So the last days began with the life and ministry of Christ. Apparently some of the things mentioned by Paul to Timothy in the letter here were occurring during Timothy's lifetime because he said from such things turn away. And, if, and, and had they not been happening in, he wouldn't have to turn away because if they were future things, he, there would be no need to turn away. But they, some of these things at least were happening even in Timothy's day. Third thing I want to mention is we know that uh, these things that Paul wrote about nearly 2,000 years ago, we know that they're still occurring today. And I, I think the obvious deduction here, uh, the obvious interpretation is that things have gotten worse since the life of Christ and they have gotten progressively worse through the years as uh, our nation and our world has gotten further and further and further away from God and the teaching of God's word. Uh, these perilous times are getting worse and worse and worse. I think that's the, the appropriate interpretation there. Things, uh, the ungodly things have gotten more frequent and more severe as we approach the end of these last days that started 2,000 years ago. You look at these nine verses, and I just want to point out a few things. I have gone through these before and dissected all these and defined all these 19 things, and I'm not going to do that tonight. If you want me to do it again sometime, you let me know. I'll be glad to do it. And, uh, but tonight, I want us to concentrate on four phrases four phrases we see in these verses. The first one's real easy. It's verse number one, perilous times shall come. We've already defined it sort of in the Greek. Uh, Kenneth, we said it means difficult. The Greek definition to, to uh, a little more specific means not tame, savage, it describes those who forget God as their creator. It describes them resembling lines and animals that are fierce and savage. So in the, in the last days, as people get further and further away from God, they will be more savage and more fierce and more awful and more and more progressively ungodly. I think it's easy to see that the times we're living in even right now, when people, let me just read this, when people, and this is just something the Lord gave me, when people have no regard for human life, when people have no respect for God, our creator, or his word, when people would rather believe CNN than KGV, K, excuse me, they would rather believe CNN than KJV, when the created turns away from the creator, shakes their fist at the creator, or simply does not believe that the creator exists or had any part of their creation, we're living in the last days and perilous times are already here. And I don't know that we say amen to that. We might just have to say, oh me. Second phrase, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. They shall be lovers of their own selves. Judges 21, 25, it's the last, it's the last verse of the last chapter of Judges. And this is twice this exact verse is used. It's four times in Judges that this is implied. And in those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Now, we've been studying through the book of Judges in Sunday school. Now we're in the book of 1 Samuel, uh, talking about you know, King Saul being anointed. By the way, let me insert this here. For anybody coming to our Sunday school class this coming Sunday, I'm skipping a week in that one-year-old quarterly, and uh, we're going to be looking at David and Goliath this week. All right, David and Goliath this week. It's 1 Samuel 17. If you want to write that down, uh, it's only the last part of that chapter. But I, of course, I go back and cover things in the first part as well. But 1 Samuel 17, if you want to be ready for Sunday morning, Sunday school right now. Let me back, back to my lesson here. All right. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everybody did that that was right in their own eyes. Three things about this verse I want to mention. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Verse number two. It's never right to do just right in your own eyes or to do what's right only for yourself. It's never right to do what's right in your own eyes. In other words, there must be some accountability. Hey man, I can't just do what I think is going to be best for JR. Steve, I think I'll go play golf tomorrow. 
I better take a boat, I guess. But uh, anyway, I, I think I, I don't think, you know, here the last couple of weeks because of the way things have fallen, uh, it's been kind of crazy. And of course, Chris is getting ready to take the kids to the lake and different things. But I'll, I've had four messages get ready this week and last week and in a couple of weeks that'll happen again. But, uh, and I love that. I'm not complaining. I absolutely love that. But, um, you know, I have people calling occasionally uh, and say, can you go play golf? And I've always told Richard Badgett, my friend, you know, who, who eventually is going to be heading back to South Africa, I said, Richard, the work has to come first. And he said, I know that, preacher. I know that. And so, you know, that's always kind of been my rule. But what if I just said, you know, Ted, I said, you know, I, I just don't want to study this week. And, you know, up until tomorrow, the weather's been pretty good, a little hot, but it's cool in the mornings. And, man, I could go play golf in the morning. And, Bob, I've got hundreds of messages packed in boxes in my house and I've got hundreds more, maybe thousands, I don't know, on the computer, I could go pull up a message from 1996 and I dare say most people wouldn't remember when I preached there, right? Most, most of you don't remember what I preached last Sunday. But anyway, uh, you can't just do what's right in your own eye. There's gotta be accountability. I mean, I mean, look at the mess that it caused in the days of old in Israel uh, that, you know, they didn't have, they said they didn't have a king and everyone did that that was right in their own eyes. That's why they had that period of 300 years of the judges. And the judges were the ones who really were not um, uh, law people that sat on a bench and judged things and uh, according to the law, they were military reformers is who the judges were. And matter of fact, we said about Samson, uh, he was his own one man army, right? But they were military reformers. And so that's what the book of Judges was all about. And they had uh, the children of Israel would sin against God and he would raise up another nation to overthrow them. Uh, and after they were overthrown, they would cry out to God and he would hear them and he would deliver them. And it, and it, and it just repeated. This, the cycle repeats itself 15 times in 300 years uh, that they had different judges. And so the people, they said there was no king in Israel. Everybody did that that was right in their own eyes. But that we can't do that because there's got to be accountability. Second thing about this phrase, in the last days there was no king in Israel. Everybody did that that was right in his own eyes. Israel had a king. Israel had a king. They just didn't recognize him. And that's what's wrong with our, most of our countries now, countries plural. We have, I mean, Jesus Christ is King of Kings, amen? I mean, he's King of all Kings. And most people just don't recognize that. And Israel didn't recognize that. They went to Samuel, who was the last judge, and they said, give us a king like all the other nations have a king. And boy, that just, that really upset him. And he goes to God and talks about it. And God said, Samuel, give him a king. Give them a king. He said, they're not rejecting you, Samuel. They're rejecting me. Remember that? They're not rejecting Samuel. They're rejecting God. And he said, here's what you need to tell the people. He said, tell them what it's going to be like when they have a king. And he told them how horrible it was going to be. And man, it was going to be horrible. And he said, what's going to happen when, when we appoint a king? Uh, he said, and he's going to be horrible. And he's going to repress you. He's going to make your men servants and soldiers and make your women uh, work in the uh, palace and different things. And he said, they'll all be as slaves. Uh, he's going to tax whatever you have, so on and so forth. And when you cry Cry out to me, he said, I'll not hear you. I'll not hear you. Isn't that, a, isn't that a horrible thought to think that people would cry out to God and he wouldn't hear? But they had a king and they just didn't recognize him. And I asked this question, has the same thing happened in America today? It really wouldn't make a whole lot of difference who sits in the, in the White House if America would recognize God as their king. Amen. It really wouldn't matter a whole lot who was sitting on the throne of the governor of North Carolina if the people of North Carolina recognized God as their king and acted that way. We have a king. Most people just have failed to recognize him. They've forgotten him. For the most part, our federal government has no concern or respect for God of his word. For the most part, our local and state government has no respect and no concern for God and his word. I'm gonna mention two names here and you can like it or lump it is what we used to say, but we need more men in politics like Mark Walker and Mark Robinson. We need more godly men like that 
that are able to stand up and, and say what they believe and, and base it on the Word of God. I told you what uh, uh, Mark Robinson said in a speech not too long ago. Uh, you know, he's a Republican, but he said he's the lieutenant governor. He said, most of y'all think I work for the GOP, but I don't. He said, I work for G-O-D. Amen. I mean, he, he just put that out there. And he, and he talks about biblical things. He preaches. Matter of fact, there's going to be a, a meeting here coming up in just a couple of weeks at Shining Light Baptist Church. And if, if God willing, I'm going to try my best to be there. It's a, it's, a, it's a luncheon. And they've invited all local pastors to be there. And Mark Robinson is the keynote speaker. But we need more men like that. But it says, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. Just doing whatever they want to do and just hope everybody's okay with it. But here's two important questions I think we need to ask ourselves concerning this, just doing what's right in your own. Remember the this, this saying probably went around in the 70s, if it feels good, do it. Yeah, that's kind of where we are. And if it feels good, do it. Here's two important questions. We're talking about federal government maybe not recognizing God like they should and local government not recognizing God like they should. By the way, did I mention this is not a touchy, feel good message? Let me ask this question. Have some of our churches lost their concern and respect for God and his word. Let me just say this. When churches are approving things that are called an abomination by God, we must assume that they are more concerned about political correctness than they are pleasing their savior. Yeah, that's not an amen, that's an old me. Have Christians across the board, all denominations, I'm not saying these people aren't saved, I'm just saying maybe they're Christians who aren't in God's will, but have Christians across the board, all denominations, lost their concern and their respect for God and his word. Now, let me ask this. Are you, ask yourself this question, are you, as a child of God, careful to make all important decisions based on what thus saith the Lord? Or do you simply do what pleases you and your family, even if you know it's not in accordance to the will of God? Do you consider God when you're deciding how often to read his word or how often to pray or how often to attend church or how often to share his word? Do you consider God in these matters and pray about these matters and say, Lord, what would you have me do? Now ask yourself this question as well. If I really love God more than I love myself, what would I do differently? Ask yourself that question. I've had to ask myself that question a time or two. Who was it? Andy Griffiths says, sometimes you gotta uh, turn around and get, a, get hold of the seat of your own britches. <laughs> yeah, if you really love God more than you love self, what would you be indifferently, doing differently on a daily basis? Third phrase, they have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. This will be a quick point because I'm, most of it's reading a quote. Kenneth Weiss translates it this way, having a mere outward semblance of piety toward God but denying the power of the same. That word piety that he uses from the original language means having a reverence for or having a sense of duty toward God. So having a reverence or a sense of duty toward God. Have, now look, it says a form of, a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. Let me read this lengthy quote from J. Vernon McGee, the, the great Presbyterian preacher. You know, I used to love his accent. Here's the quote. Remember, this is his quote. Everything I'm reading is his quote right here. This is the age or the form of organized religion. We have a local council of churches, the national council of churches, the world council of churches, and now one gigantic attempt is being made to get all churches together and cooperate to bring world peace. The set, this sets the stage for the appearing of the false Messiah known as the Antichrist. And the only thing that hinders his revelation, talk about him being revealed, is the fact that the church is still here. When the church is taken out, and it will be before the false Messiah is revealed, the lukewarm, 
liberal and pagan religions will unite. The Antichrist will take over the reins of religion here on this earth and will set himself up as God to be worshiped as God. The stage is set, the curtain is about to be drawn. God give us more ministers who know that the cause of Christ is not advanced by organization or program, but through the demonstration of the Holy Spirit by the word of God and sincere worship in spirit and in truth. The average big denominational church has a packed auditorium on Sunday morning, but they have service, uh, but if they have services on Sunday night, prayer meeting night or revival night, there will only be a handful of people in attendance. This is the age of the pleasure loving church members going through forms and rituals on Sunday morning, then hanging their religion in the closet along with their Sunday suit until the next Sunday. They have a form of worship, but they deny the power of God. They deny the supernatural and deny a living reality in religion. I said that was J. Vernon McGee and I told you wrong. That was Dr. Oliver B. Green. Dr. Oliver B. Green. These people have a sense of reverence and duty toward God, but they are denying his power. The word denying used here means to contradict, to reject, or to refuse the power of God. So they have a sense of reverence, a sense of religion, a sense of duty toward God, but they contradict with their lifestyle the very God that they seem to be having an appearance of respect for anyway. Another question, is it possible that our daily actions, our daily lifestyle, our daily conduct will reveal whether we have a form of godliness or we actually have a relationship with the almighty God where we can recognize him as the supreme authority in our lives and strive to please him in all that we say, think, or do. Let me ask you this, what do you have? Do you have a form of godliness or do you have a relationship with God Almighty? One more phrase and then I'll wrap it up with an application. The fourth phrase is in verse number seven, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth, verse seven. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Verse number seven is directly tied in with verses five and six where it speaks of those uh, who have a form of godliness but not the, deny the power thereof. And it talks about the, those who creep into the houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with various lusts and all this. Now, a after reading what several theologians had to say, I think this phrase, silly women, in general, speaks to silly men as well. Okay, you ladies can pat me on the back later, all right? But I think it's silly women and silly men. However, directly speaking, as it was written 2,000 years ago in a letter from Paul to Timothy, I think there was something going on uh, somewhere in the area of Ephesus where Timothy was overseeing the church. And uh, I think there was something going on there where there were some deceivers creeping into, sneaking into houses and leading women away, not so much kidnapping them or anything like that, but teaching them with false doctrine and confusing them and taking them away from the very word of God and the practice of being a solid Christian. I think that's what was going on in Timothy's time. But uh, my focus here tonight is on the sort. Let's look at it again. Um, verse number five, having a form of godliness, but not denying the power thereof. For of this sort, are they which creep into, sneak into, slink into houses and lead captive silly women laden uh, with sins, led away with various lusts. And it says about these ones who were pulling them away, drawing them away, they are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. I think, and this will be very brief, this part of it, but hopefully it'll be a mouthful in a very short phrase. I think there are many well-educated preachers and teachers who have years of experience, years of teaching, years of learning, but they've really never come to the knowledge of the truth. And you watch some of the big time TV preachers and you'll know what I'm talking about. 
Now, I'm not saying that all big time TV preachers are bad. Uh, probably my favorite teacher that you can hear anymore on TV is a man who's home with the Lord now, and that's Adrian Rogers. You know, he's on probably several times a week. David Jeremiah is another good one, Charles Stanley. Uh, and I'm going to be honest with you, I don't, I don't care what I'm trying to think of Charles Stanley's son's name. Chris, you, you're back there? Andy, Andy Stanley. We, when we were on the cruise to Alaska that this church so graciously sent us on, the um, uh, In Touch Ministries cruise, uh, we got to hear Charles Stanley and his son Andy. Uh, and uh, I enjoyed Andy Stanley's teaching. Uh, I told, I, I, this straight up contemporary, almost heavenly metal music. But uh, I told somebody I tolerated the music so I could enjoy the preaching. But there's good preachers out there, and some of them are on TV. But, but you know what I'm talking about. There's some phony blonies out there. Uh, I, I just got to throw this in. I'll, I'll call one name, and then we move on. We're talking about these false teachers who lead people away, all right? I, was, I don't know why I was home one Sunday morning years ago. Uh, I must have been sick. I don't know. About, but I turned on the TV, and this is before we had watch, what, what, what's not watch, Facebook, and all this stuff. This was 20 years ago or more. And guess who was on TV that morning but Ernest Ainsley. I used to call him Ernest Angry, <laughs> uh, and I'd never seen his program before. But uh, uh, apparently, usually, he gave a lot of time and attention to healing at the end of his, of his service. And, and, and that day, he had preached too long, and he didn't have uh, enough time for the healing service. So he's up on the platform. It's a big church. I mean, probably bigger than this, and it, it's packed full. And at the end of service, he walks down from the platform and there's people, Pat, there's people lined up just as far as you can see in, in the front. Like this is the front row of pews and there were, at, at every person there was people standing here just like this. And then there was a person standing by, uh, well actually two people standing behind each of those one people. And uh, he didn't have time to ask them what their ailments were or anything. Uh, he just had a couple minutes left. And so he would come by and hit them in the forehead and say, heal. And as he hit them, they'd fall backwards into the arms of those two men waiting. Well, he's got, honestly, I'm, he's going, heal, 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 heal. And he come up to a guy about my size and hit him in the head and he didn't go down. <laughs> and he backed up and went, Bam, and hit him again and said, heal. And uh, that's as phony baloney as anything you can get in this world. And so we got to be careful who we're listening to. And we got to be careful who we're reading because there's a lot of clever men out there and they're charismatic and they can uh, lure your way if you're not well grounded in the truth of God's word. It actually translates, they've never come to a precise and experiential knowledge of the truth. They've never had a real experience with the God of truth. In other words, they can't teach the truth of God's word because they've never had a relationship with the God who wrote the word. They do not have experiential knowledge. Now, application. How do we deal with these teachers? Just a couple of things I'm done. From such turn away. Greek. We are to be constantly shunning these types of people. Constantly. So how do we identify who these false teachers are? Well, it says, but verse number 10, but thou hast fully known my doctrine. Look at verse 10, but thou hast fully known my, of course, Paul writing this, my doctrine, my manner of life, my purpose, my faith, my long suffering, which is patience, charity, patience. Uh, he said, thou hast fully known my doctrine. Second Timothy 2.15 is just a few verses it's probably on the same page of your Bible. Study to show thyself approved unto the pastor. No. Study to show thyself approved unto your mom and dad. No. Study to show, show thyself approved unto the Southern Baptist Convention. No. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Amen. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We must read the word. We must study the word. We must be very careful who we read and who we watch on TV because they can lead us away like those women in the days of Paul. There's hundreds, probably thousands of teachers who can claim to be teachers of the word of God. But if you know the doctrines of God's words well enough, you can compare what these people are saying to God's holy, righteous word, and you should be able to identify the false teachers. 
study the original. Close with this illustration. Heard it many years ago. It sure seems to fit. I didn't, I didn't have it in writing. I didn't even think about it to just now. I guess the Lord gave it to me as a reminder. They tell me, this is an old story as well. They tell me that people who work for the U.S. Treasury, uh, when they are going to st study how to identify counterfeit bills, that what they do is study the real thing. They study all the bills, you know, the, the ones and fives and tens and twenty, all the way through. But they study them and they test them on them and they study them and they test them on them. They study and they test, they study and they test so that they know, I mean, backwards and forwards, they know what a real bill looks like. And when they have it in their mind what a real bill looks like, they can spot a phony as soon as they see it. Amen? Well, that's the way it is with the Word of God. If you study the original, the Word of God, and you I don't mean just read it, but study the Word of God and, and just indulge yourself in the doctrines of God's Word, then when somebody preaches something that is not like the original, it doesn't add up, it's not what you've read in God's Word, you'll know it right away. And you can call me and say, preacher, I was listening to so-and-so and and he preached this the other day. I said, what do you think about that? Well, the Word of God says this and it contradicts what that man said. Well, anything that contradicts the Word of God is indeed a lie, right? That's right. Hey, study the book. <laughs> Lee Stewart used to say, get your nose in the book and keep it there. <laughs> Amen. I like that. Let's study the Word of God so we'll be able to spot a phony a mile away. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your many